from the initial contact between the Meskwaki and Anglo-Americans sprouted 200 years of strife and warfare. Today, however, at the Meskwaki settlement in Tama, Iowa, tribal customs endure. The Sac and Fox tribe of the Mississippi and Iowa, who prefer the traditional name Meskwaki, sustain an environment where their culture and language prosper. This is a legacy of defiant Meskwaki leadership that has made them the last tribe of Iowa. It was here in the backwoods of what is now central Wisconsin where French traders encountered a fiercely independent tribe in 1665, the Meskwaki, whom the French called the Fox. With the name meaning people of the Red Earth, the Meskwaki had only recently arrived in Wisconsin following a series of migrations from Canada. French Jesuits soon constructed a mission along the Wolf River with the intent of eliminating what they called an abominable tribal religion. The Meskwaki responded by burning it to the ground. The Meskwaki soon became the only tribe that refused to submit to French colonizers, prompting French King Louis XV to order a war of extermination. In the mid-1730s, a mere 350 surviving Meskwakis crossed the Mississippi River into Iowa, where they were finally safe from constant assault and slaughter. By the 1780s, the Mississippi River Valley had become the permanent home of the Meskwaki and linguistically related Sauk tribe. In Iowa, the tribal government continued to function much as it had for hundreds of years. Traditional Meskwaki government was formed of a war chief and an okama or civil chief from each village who shared power with village councils known as Ketchetaisiak. The okama were considered leaders of the tribe in major peacetime functions. Oftentimes, however, the Ketchetaisiak had the first to approve their decisions. The United States first signed a treaty with the two tribes in 1804. At this time, Okamak from the Sauk tribe were eager to mitigate tensions after Sauk warriors scalped several settlers. The Sauk Okamak, however, were entirely unaware that they were giving away a massive tract of land, including their principal village. Furthermore, none of the Sauks who signed the treaty were authorized to sell land by their Ketchetai Sauk. Meskwaki leaders were not even invited to negotiations. Then in 1830, Sioux and warriors murdered the principal Meskwaki Okama, Bia Mushkat. A warrior named Pawashik was thus nominated to be temporary Okama. Under Pawashik's leadership, the Meskwaki would enter one of their most trying times in modern history. In 1824, President James Monroe addressed Congress on the subject of Indian removal, stating, To remove them by force would be revolting to humanity and utterly unjustifiable. Just four years later, however, President Andrew Jackson changed the tone by signing the 1830 Indian Removal Act, ordering all native peoples east of the Mississippi River to leave their homelands. In response, a warrior named Black Hawk led a band of Sauk into a devastating war in 1832. Although most Meskwaki and Sauk were uninvolved in Black Hawk's war, they were forced to pay by selling their eastern Iowa lands, which included the economically vital to be lead mines. Over the next decade, Iowa territory was sliced and stripped from the Meskwaki. Successive treaties in 1830, 1832, 1836, 1837, and 1842 with provisions extending into 1843 pushed the Meskwaki further and further west. Disregarding the traditional values of the Meskwaki people, Army General Winfield Scott appointed a Sauk named Keokuk as head Okama and negotiator of both tribes. Keokuk was not of the proper lineage to assume such a title, and Meskwaki Okamak were not recognized as legitimate tribal leaders. In an 1841 letter addressed to Governor of Iowa Territory John Chambers, a group of Meskwaki under Powashik's leadership demanded to be included in treaty agreements. Nonetheless, the onslaught of white settlers was relentless. Between 1832 and 1845, the tribe's populations were halved by disease, fighting, and alcoholism. Indian agents dispatch dire reports. The whole nation exhibits a continual scene of the most revolting intoxication. What can you promise these Indians by removal? They are rapidly melting away. On October 11th, 1842, under immense social and economic pressure, Keokuk and Powashik were persuaded into selling 11 million acres of their remaining Iowa lands. 
Powashik, however, was determined to never lead his people from the river bottoms and plains of Iowa, where the bones of his ancestors were buried. At each Meskwaki village, distraught men and women wailed as they left their beloved land. The faces of their stoutest men were bathed in tears, wrote one witness. For three years, the tribes were congregated near Fort Des Moines before removal to Kansas Indian Territory. As he had done for so many years before, Powashik twice led his band back to the Iowa River Valley. Mounted soldiers promptly returned them to Fort Des Moines each time. While Keokuk obediently led the Sauk to Kansas in 1845, the Meskwakis only departed after Indian agent John Beach threatened to forcibly remove them. Just seven years earlier, the army aided in the forced removal of the Cherokee on the Trail of Tears. This brutal operation had resulted in the deaths of more than 4,000 people. Despite these warnings, 1,000 Meskwakis under the leadership of Powashik and his brother Wetama went into hiding in remote southwest Iowa. Tribal leaders simply refused to take their people to the Kansas Reservation, where hundreds of Sauk and Meskwaki were soon dying in a cholera epidemic. Hopelessness and despair were the, what I would say, the um, attitude of the reservation, because they were put in a place that they didn't know how the land worked, and being given no choices whatsoever in um, your fate is cruelty. While life on the scant reservation was grim, Meskwaki leaders had all the more motivation to return to their Iowa homeland. Some members of Powashik's band never even left Iowa, where they built relationships with white settlers and government leaders. Meskwakis were going out and convincing them, we're not going to fight with you, we're not going to cause any problems, we just want to come back and be in you know, this homeland that we've remade. Finally, in 1856, through the diplomacy of Meskwaki leaders, the Iowa General Assembly declared that the tribe be hereby permitted to remain and reside in Iowa. To show how unique this thing in Iowa happened is at the same time in the 1850s, in 1852, the state of California, they spent one million dollars on scalp hunters to kill Indians. Iowa's unprecedented decision paved the way for Powashik's successor, Memin Wanaka, to lead 300 Meskwakis back to Iowa. In 1857, a group of Meskwaki men under Memin Wanaka's command purchased an 80-acre plot of woodland along the Iowa River in Tama County, where the Meskwaki remain today. I was told that you do not ever call that a reservation when you go to Tama. They're very adamant about that because they purchased their own land. It's provided a safe haven for us to practice our religion, speak our language, raise our children, raise our crops, and just live. I think it's certainly tied to that land ownership and the fact that the community has been able to stay here and stabilize over the last century and a half. During the early 1990s, Iowa's first casino was controversially established at the settlement. Using funds from the casino, a $27 million state-of-the-art high school was constructed with the mission to endow all Meskwaki youth with the unique heritage and language of their people. And the casino doesn't infringe on our daily lives so much. We don't let it. We don't. We're a tribe with a casino. We're not a casino with a tribe. Iowa's Meskwaki settlement has inherited the legacy of Meskwakis who opposed removal to Indian territory. The fierce leadership of the tribe that birthed the settlement has tempered into a lasting cultural legacy that will grace their land for generations to come.